Hello everyone, welcome again to Biofluid Mechanics and uh, today uh, we, we start the uh, third part of the semester, the lectures comprising uh, the third portion of the semester. Remember we, we broke up the semester into three components, into three parts. Uh, the first one was an uh, introduction to uh, the cardiovascular anatomy, physiology and function and, uh, and some solutions, analytical solutions, and part two was modeling of uh, <clears throat> of these uh, cardiovascular circuits, starting with the simple RL circuits, then moving to RLC circuits, resistance, inductance, and compliance, uh, each of these three elements modeling a different aspect of the hydrodynamics and the blood flow. And uh, so starting today, we're going to continue to introduce more elements and to add complexity to the system. And in particular, at some point, uh, we'll come up with a, a better way of modeling the heart itself as a pump. So far, we have been modeling the heart as a um, essentially as a sinusoidal wave, but we know that uh, the, 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 the pressure signal uh, emitted by the heart is not directly uh, a sinusoidal wave. Uh, we, we've seen this, this data, so we are going to formulate one that actually uh, looks uh, very, very close to, to what the heart signal actually is, the, the pressure signal, and uh, we is going to have parameters to, to actually control the size of the signal, the pulse, the the time scale and so on. But uh, what we're going to look at today is the ability to control the passage of flow to a valve. And uh, in, in hydrodynamics, we call these valves, and many kinds of valves, uh, butterfly valves, gate valves, ball valves, and so on and so forth. But in, in electrical uh, engineering or electrical systems analogy, uh, valves will be actually uh, uh, illustrated by the use of diodes. A diode in an electric circuit is essentially an element that allows the flow of electricity to go in a single direction. It prevents the flow, the flow of electricity from, from going in, in both directions. So it acts as a check valve, and it also has the capability of, of uh, having a specific voltage that needs to be uh, applied across to be able for the flow to go through. So this is uh, essentially perfect for our needs because uh, uh, hard valves in particular are such that uh, they only allow, in regular cases, in healthy cases, the, 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 the flow of blood to, to go in a single direction. They don't allow reverse flow. And in addition to that, uh, they allow a certain pressure differential to occur across the valve for the valve to open. So uh, we are going to be able to model that using this element of diodes. So let's go, uh, let's go straight to the dog cam and uh, start formulating this. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, biofluid mechanics. And this is uh, lecture number 19, which is lecture one for the third part of the semester. So, valves in cardiovascular circuits. So a valve can be modeled using a combination, using a combination of a diode, which I already explained is an element that allows flow in a specific direction, and a corresponding resistor to basically account for the viscous loss across the valve. So the valve not only impedes the flow in a particular direction, but also it introduces an additional loss of pressure to the flow passing through the structure. So in a cardiovascular circuit, if we have a node, where pressure P1 is placed, and this is the way we illustrate a diode in an electric circuit, triangle in a gate. So this is the valve V, and uh, uh, right after the valve, we have a resistor RV, and this will be P2, and this, there will be a QV of time passing through this two nodes if there is a pressure differential. So 
the idea here is that uh, pressure one is higher than pressure two, therefore the flow is going to go in that direction. Uh, but if pressure two is higher than pressure one, the flow will not go in the opposite direction. The valve will prevent that. So the diode is an electrical element designed to allow flow in one direction. and prevent flow in the opposite direction. So that is QV of T will be equal to zero if P1 is less than P2 and it will be P1 minus P2 divided by RB. This is simply Ohm's law. It's the difference between the pressure divided by the resistance. If P1 is greater or equal than P2, obviously if they're equal to each other, then the subtraction is zero, so the flow will be zero. All right, so there's a sort of a discontinuity there uh, that introduces a, an anomaly to the set of equations. And this anomaly is going to result in the numerics actually responding with certain instabilities that we will have to mitigate. And we'll see that in the, in the spreadsheet today in the, when we go to the MathCAD exam. So the discontinuity can be formulated in terms of the heavy side step function h of x so if you remember from your calculus classes this heavy heavy side step function and by the way this is the last name it's not that is a function that has a heavy side it's just has the name of the person who developed this function it's a function that can be either zero or one so in this case h of x is equal to zero if x is less than zero and it's equal to one if x is greater than zero and it's equal to a non-determined number between zero and one if uh, the value of x is equal to zero so if you plot this In an xy diagram, the function will be zero, and as soon as x is equal to or larger than zero, then the function will step to one. So that's why it's called a step function. This is h of x. This is h of x. Okay. So when the argument of the function is less than zero, then the function is zero, and when the argument of the function is greater than zero, then the function is equal to one. This is a very simple unit step function, but it will be, it will be very, come in very handy when modeling this type of things. So we can actually shift the location of the step by modifying the argument, so which can be shifted to point x0. So right now the step occurs at x equals 0, right here. So we can shift that by to a point x0 anywhere on the left side or on the right side by simply modifying the argument of the function. So this uh, can be done. This h of x minus x0 is equal to 0 if x is less than x0 and is equal to 1 if x is greater than x0. So this is basically how we just switch it or modify it or shift it. So if we plot this, and this is x, and let's say that x0 is here, which can also be on the left side of the uh, y-axis, but let's say that it's right there, then the function will jump to 1 right here, and it will continue forever. So this is the function h of x minus x0, and this right here is 1, same step size. Step size still equal to one. 
So, therefore, the flow rate through the valve is QV of T, so we don't need to do the if or anything like that. What we need to do simply is, is P1 minus P2 divided by RV times the heavy set step function of P1 minus P2. So basically, QV, if the argument of the heavy side set function is negative, if P1 minus P2 is a negative number, then H is equal to zero, and therefore Q is zero. If P1 minus P2 is a positive number, then this is one, and then QV will be P1 minus P2 over RV, which is exactly what we wrote in the definition of the flow through the valve. So this essentially gives us a formulation, a single equation that can capture the behavior of the flow through the valve. So <clears throat> now the problem is here that uh, if you notice, now these QV, the Q through the valve, is a nonlinear function of the pressures because we have pressures multiplying something that is a function of the pressure. It's a nonlinearity in the equations. And um, nonlinearities usually lack analytical solutions or exact solutions. When we see a nonlinearity in an equation, in general, we cannot uh, formulate or generalize the, uh, the analytical solution process. But more importantly, when you're trying to do this numerically through approximations, you have to be very careful as to how you treat the numerical integrators and make sure you control the time steps and so on so that you avoid certain instabilities that are due because of these switches, because it's nonlinearity. So note that state variables P1 and P2 so remember, this was going to be part of a much larger system of equations. So we're going to have enough in a full circuit. Now, now multiply each other. We we'll multiply a function of p1 and p2. So multiply themselves effectively, which renders the system of equations, the eventual eventual system of equations, nonlinear. Okay, well, that is a, not a good word when you're trying to solve a system of differential equations or a single differential equation. The system now is nonlinear because at least one of the equations will be nonlinear. However, this is a very, how should I put it? This is a, a, a very slight nonlinearity a sort of a removable nonlinearity, a very uh, simple one, because it basically means that this, the, the system will switch from two different states that are linear, and it will switch from one state to the other, so we only have to be careful when this, the system is actually switching. This nonlinearity is partially avoidable, by switching, not stitching, switching between linear states. So what I mean by this is that the system behaves linearly, and as soon as that pressure difference, P1 minus P2, hits the threshold of zero, then it will switch to another type of system that is linear. But that switch is actually where we have to be careful. In addition, there can be a trigger, trigger, pressure, PV. Let's just use a little hat on top of it. Can be implemented into the model. of the valve as so a trigger pressure is nothing but a pressure that will be necessary to open the valve so so far we've been saying that if the pressure difference across is greater than zero then the valve opens but some valves actually respond to a higher pressure threshold 
essentially meaning that uh, you have the pressure difference across the valve has to be larger than a particular number for the valve to be able to open. And that we call the trigger pressure, PV. So in this case, the valve flow is equal to P1 minus P2 divided by RV times the heavy side step function of P1 minus P2 minus PV. So in this particular model, it's no longer just necessary for the pressure difference across the valve to be positive for the valve to open. It has to be positive plus a little bit. So the pressure difference across the valve has to be higher than a particular threshold pressure for the valve to open. So these allows flow rate across the valve only when a threshold, I'm missing an H in threshold, um, value of pressure PV is surpassed. That's what it means. So essentially, the valve will not open. H will not be equal to 1 if P1 minus P2 is just simply 0 or is larger than 0. It has to be larger than this particular number for this H to be uh, to be uh, to be open, to be 1. All right, so let's go straight to an example. Let me go to a new page here. And write the circuit. So, so let's say that we have uh, this pump. And again, we're going to model this pump as a sinusoidal, uh, as a sinusoidal pressure wave. There's QP that goes through it. We're going to call this note P0. Then immediately after P0, we're going to have a valve V and we're going to have a corresponding RV, the resistance induced by the valve. So this is the same thing as QP. See, there's no bifurcation. So this flow, according to KCL, the flow coming into this node has to be equal to the flow going out of this node. And then we have Let's say P1 here with an associated um, compliance C1 and Q1. And then we have R, L, and a corresponding, we're just, we're just going to call this Q. We can call this RA and LA, but we only have one R and one L, so we just call this, this one Q instead of QA. And then a P2 with a corresponding C2 and the flow Q2 going into this compliance and then closing out the circuit completely. And by the way, these one they remain here. And again, you can call it anything else you want, but as, after you apply KCL, you'll know that this is the same thing as QP. The Q of the pump. All right. So nothing changes. We the same rules apply. Our state variables will be P1, Q, and P2. So there will be one P for every compliance and one Q for every inductor. Uh, in the system of equations, in the eventual system of equations. And when we formulate the equations, we get the following. In the first compliance, we get C1 times dP1 dt is equal to Q1. So this one is one that we have to get rid of using KCLs and KVLs uh, because that's not part of the state variables. Second equation says that P1 minus P2, this pressure minus this pressure, is L dQ dt plus R Q of t. So that remains, that remains, that remains, and that remains, and this one remains, because those are all state variables. 
in the second equation, the third equation, I'm sorry, C2 dP2 dt, which stays, is equal to Q2 of t, which needs to go. By the way, it's not x, it's t. All right. So the valve equation, we throw it in here. And let's assume that this valve has a zero pressure of a, of a trigger, a trigger, the zero trigger pressure. But let's just say that QP, we're not, call, we're not calling it QV, we're calling it QP because it's the same thing as the flow of the pump, is equal to P0 minus P1 divided by RV times the heavy side step function of P0 minus P1 minus PV some trigger pressure okay um, if we apply KCL at note number one we don't need to apply a number zero because we already established that the flow going in is equal to the flow going out so QP here is equal to QP here it's already uh, illustrated in the in the circuit itself but in P1 we we have a bifurcation so QP should be equal to Q1 plus Q so QP is equal to Q1 plus Q of T. Well, KCL at 2 says that, point 2, says that Q goes in is equal to Q2 plus QP. So Q is equal to Q2 plus QP. So here you can see that uh, um, we can use these equations to eliminate Q1 and Q2. So we can solve for Q1 from here is QP minus Q. And we can solve for Q2 here is Q minus QP. And then QP will come out of here, but we'll still have a PC or there to worry about. All right. So let's continue. This gives us a, an opportunity to eliminate K1, uh, Q1 and Q2. And then KVL, we have P0 minus P1 plus P1 minus P2 is equal to the delta P of the pump, which is known. All right. So the mesh rule says that all the pressure drops have to be equal to each other. And this was the pressure gain, so it goes to the right hand side. Um, so, combining KCL at 1 with valve equation. So we have Q1 is equal to QP minus Q of T. And therefore, Q1 is equal to P0 minus P1, this is QP, over RV, times the heavy side step function of P0 minus P1 minus PV minus Q of T. So I'm replacing this QP with this whole thing, the Q of the pump which is the valve equation. And now, using KVL, which is, we can eliminate uh, it's P0 minus P1 plus P1 minus P2 plus delta P. We can identify that simply P0 minus P1 is equal to delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2. So I'm just solving for PC or minus P1 to replace it here. So that will render Q1 of T. We can replace PC or minus P1 with this whole thing. Delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 divided by RV times the heavy side step function of 
delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 minus PV minus Q of T. So that is the equation for Q1. So we've effectively eliminated Q1 from the set of equations as a function of state variables only, P1 and P2, P1 and P2, and Q. So no P0, no Q1. So Q1 now is in terms of state variables only, which is what we want to do. We can do the same. So combining KCL at 2 with valve equation, same thing. So Q2 of T is equal to Q of T minus QP of T. So Q2 of T is equal to Q of T minus P0 minus P1 divided by RV times H of P0 of T minus P1 of T minus PV. And then using KVL, so that's to replace P0 minus P1 with state variables only and known quantities, then we get Q2 of T is equal to Q of T minus delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 divided by RV times H of delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 minus PV. And that is the equation for Q2. So now we have an equation for Q1 in terms of state variables only, and an equation for Q2 in terms of state variables only. Still includes a heavy side function, which induces nonlinearity into the set of equations. But it is a set of equations that only depends on the state variables. All right, so let's go to here. So introduce these into equations and what we get is dp1 dt is equal to minus 1 over c1 times q of t plus delta p of the pump minus p1 minus p2 so this is Q1. I'm replacing this whole thing by Q1. RV C1. So everything is divided by C1 from this equation. Times H of delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 minus PV. That's equation one. Equation two, very simple. DQ DT is equal to 1 over L P1 of T minus R over L Q of T minus 1 over L P2 of T. Sounds very simple. And then the last equation, DP2 DT of T is equal to 1 over C2 Q of T minus delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 RB over C2 and H that has the same exact argument as up here delta P of the pump minus P1 of time minus P2 of time minus PV. This doesn't change it's just the argument that opens and closes the ball. So that's a set of equation now that depends only on the state variables p1, q, and p2. There's nothing in there that is not known or p1, p, uh, q, and p2.
So now we have a system the following system y dot is equal to a times y plus these b uh, that depends on y of t. So we push all the nonlinearities. These, remember, are nonlinear terms. This is p multiplying p, or p multiplying a function of p. That, that uh, means nonlinearity. So we push all the nonlinear terms into the right hand side vector b, right? And keep or kept the matrix well behaved. So, such that the state variables vector is simply p1, q, and p2. So it's a three by one vector. And the corresponding matrix A of t, the matrix of coefficient, coefficients is only see in the first equation we have zero multiplying p1 minus one over c1 multiplying q and zero multiplying p2 so it's zero minus one over c1 and zero the second equation has one over l multiplying p1 minus r over l multiplying q and minus one over l multiplying p2 <coughs> And the third equation has zero multiplying uh, P1 minus one, I'm sorry, positive one over C2 multiplying Q and zero multiplying P2. So it's a very well behaved uh, matrix of coefficients. And we push all the nonlinearities down to the right hand side vector B. So the right hand side vector B, which depends on the function, on the solution itself, on the state variables themselves, that's what makes it nonlinear. It's a three by one vector where the first coefficient is uh, so delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 divided by RBC1 times H with that corresponding argument. It's whatever makes the H uh, the, the, the valve open, which is essentially the pressure across it minus the trigger pressure P, PB. Uh, so this is the same as this argument, this argument up here, which is the same as this argument up here. There's a single valve. The second element is zero. It's a corresponding element for equation number two. There's no right-hand side independent term. And the third element is simply the negative of delta P of the pump minus P1 minus P2 divided by RV C2 times the heavy side step function with the same argument. So there's the three components of the system of equations. The state variable vector, the matrix of coefficients, and the right hand side vector of independent terms. All right. Now the alternative is instead of pushing the nonlinearities to the right hand side vector, what we can do is just simply say, okay, well, what if the valves open and what if the valves close? So there's only two alternatives, two state, state uh, uh, switch states in this particular system. So if the valves open, we have a system of equations, and the valve, if the valves close, then there's, a, there's another system of equations. So the way it goes is as follows. So instead of formulating a single system, we formulate an open and closed system. So alternatively, we can formulate the system of equations in terms of two switched states. It's the same state variables, P1, Q, and P2. Okay, that doesn't change. But we have a, a, a system of equations for them when the valves open and another system of equations when the valves close. So if you look at this, if you look at the system of equations, and if you assume that the valve is open, so H is equal to 1, then you'll have P1 and P2 dividing RV and C1. 
as part of the system of equations. And a right-hand side term, d delta p uh, divided by rv and c1. So these equations becomes, becomes much simpler. So basically, if p0 minus p1 is greater than the trigger pressure, that's what opens the valve. Or since we replace p0 minus p1 using KVL with delta p of the pump minus, well, let's go, that's a function of t, minus p1 minus p2 is greater than PV. So if the valve is open, the valve is open, and therefore H of this whole thing is equal to one. And if H is equal to one, then we have a matrix A0, or a open, that looks like this. So we have additional terms, minus one over RVC1, minus 1 over C1, 1 over RV C1, then this, this one's don't change, or 1 over L, uh, minus R over L, minus 1 over L, and then this one is 1 over RV C2, 1 over C2, and minus 1 over RV C2, R V C2. So this is A0. And the right hand side vector, B0, which is no longer nonlinear, is just simply a 3 by 1 vector. That's delta P of the pump divided by RV C1, 0, and delta P of the pump negative. divided by rv c2 so we have the system of equations when the valve is open and if you go back to the equations if the valve is closed that means that this argument is less than zero so the pressure differential across the valve is less than the trigger pressure so this will be negative therefore h will be zero and if H will be zero, this entire thing will disappear, and this entire thing will disappear along with the right-hand side quantity. So what happens? So if the pressure across the valve is less than the trigger pressure, that means the same as saying that delta P of the pump minus P1 minus p2 is less than pv then the valve is closed or closed then h of all the stuff is equal to zero this will render a coefficient matrix ac that looks like zero minus one over c1 zero 1 over L minus R over L minus 1 over L. And finally, 0, uh, 1 over C2 and 0. The original matrix that we had. And the right-hand side vector B close is equal to 0, 0, and 0. Nothing happens on the right-hand side. So basically, this is two sets of equations for the same state variables. The coefficient y or the, uh, the vector y doesn't change. So we have the system a of t times y of t plus b of t. So basically, switch a. between N and B, between open and close, between O and C, depending on the conditions, okay, depending on whether the pressure difference across the valve is actually above the limit or above the threshold or not. All right, so let's test this. 
Now let's see how we implement this conditioning for the switch systems in a system of equations that has uh, uh, actual actual numbers. And by the way, you have two switch systems because you have a single valve. The valve has a binary uh, outcome, either it's open or closed. But if you had two valves, then you have four possible switch states, right? Between one being open, the other one being closed, the other one, one being open, the other one being open, and vice versa. So let's solve this system using the fourth order Runge-Kutta method using the following parameters. So we have R equals to 10 millimeters of mercury over milliliter second. We have L being 0 0.1 millimeters of mercury milliliters second square. This makes C1 equals 1 milliliters per milliliters of mercury, and C2 also 1 milliliters per milliliters of mercury. And uh, the valve, RV, is equal to 2 millimeters of mercury per milliliter second, so the resistor across the valve. And the threshold pressure, let's make it zero. So essentially meaning that all the valve needs is a pressure difference across to be positive greater than zero to be able to um, to be able to open and let uh, delta p of the pump be equal to the usual sine omega t plus b okay and let's pick an a of 60 and a b of, uh, of uh, an a of 30 and a b of 60 as usual uh, and, and a frequency of one cycle per, per second to, to model this. So basically, we can play with those numbers and see how it affects, but this is for illustration purposes. And let's uh, let's go to a MathCAD file. Um, all right, so I've already put this MathCAD file available on, on Canvas. This is the corresponding MathCAD file for uh, lecture 19. Again, uh, and by the way, in my notes, I say, Let's use a runge kutta solver, and from this point on, we're not going to be able to get away with using less than the runge kutta solver because of this nonlinearity. Remember, there's certain instabilities that come across when you switch from one state to the other, from the open to the closed state, and that induces instabilities in the in the numerical solution process. So you need a high order solver to be able to mitigate these instabilities. Not only that, at some point we're going to have to control uh, the the time stepping process. So here we go. So, oh, so we set the origin at one again from this point on. This is what we're going to do is uh, set the array origins to one instead of zero to, to basically illustrate the fact that we have multiple equations uh, a little seamlessly. Um, uh, maximum pressure 120, minimum pressure 60, and the uh, frequency of one cycle per second. So the frequency omega is 2 pi f, and the amplitude is 30, and the offset is 90. And this is our delta p of the pump, a sine omega t plus b. Um, let's analyze this for 10 cycles and see what happens. And let's start with a time step uh, of 0 0.1. So 100 time steps total in 10 seconds. That makes every delta t or every time step equals to 0 0.1 seconds. Um, and this is how the pump signal looks like. It's very jagged. But we'll see if we can get away with solving the system of equations of three state variables with only 100 time steps using runge kutta which we have been able to, at least before we introduce the diode into the system. Before, even though this actually produced a very jagged type of uh, pressure signal for the pump, we've been able to capture the solution actually quite accurately, even with only 100 time steps, or only essentially 10 time steps per heart cycle. So that had been enough until now. So let's see now. The resistor is 10, the inductor is 0 0.1, each compliance is 1. The valve uh, resistor is 2, while the valve trigger pressure or threshold pressure is 0. Okay, K is equal to 3, essentially. Uh, so we have three state variables. Um, the initial conditions, let's keep it at 0. And remember that the uh, I've actually altered this set of equations in this particular case to make them P1, P2, and Q instead of P1, Q, and P2, as I had it in the notes. And that just basically 
uh, alters the configuration of this matrix. It's, it's the same exact matrix and vectors I, as I had before, but this just the location of the of uh, the quantities are in a different place. So the location of the of the components of the matrix or the elements of the matrix shift a little bit. So we're shifting column two and column three and row two and row three. And if you compare these two, the nodes are identical. But did, uh, this is an exercise to show you that it really doesn't matter how you write the set of equations and what order you write the state variables as long as you're consistent in all your three equations. And what's going to happen is essentially the uh, elements of the matrix are going to switch. You can change this and bring it back to the uh, to the way that we have it in the notes, but nothing will change in the solution process. All right, so the open matrix, the coefficient matrix in the right-hand side vector looks fully populated like this. Well, the closed one, the when the valve is closed, the system looks like this. So we have to switch between these and these, right, between AC or NAC, and between B0 and BC, depending on the conditions uh, across, the, across the valve, depending on the pressure, basically, across the valve. So we have to introduce a couple of a uh, a couple of uh, uh, um, uh, conditionals. In this case, notice that there's a, a few conditionals here. If if if, and let me explain those. So, so this Runge Kuta code is identical to the previous one. What we're doing is that we're filling out a matrix A and a vector B with A zero B zero or with A C B C depending on the conditions themselves. So if we're going to let A and B be equal to the open matrix and open vector. But if delta P of the pump plus Y2 minus Y1, which is P2 minus P1, right, is less than the trigger pressure of the pump, then that means that the valve is closed. And if the valve is closed, then we're going to use A as AC, AC and we're going to use BC for B instead. So effectively replacing A0 and B0. That's all we're going to do, right? So we calculate K1, right? Then we calculate, um, again, K2, but we have to implement the same condition. So if, uh, if the valve closes now, if the valve closes, we use the closed system, and if the valve's open, we use the open system, right? Same condition as we had before, uh, but at time plus half a delta T. Remember, you calculate the predictor K1 at time equal uh, t, but then the correctors k2 and k3 at time equal t plus half a delta t, and then the final corrector q4, you calculate at the next time level. So at the next time level, you find out whether the valve has opened or closed, or whether this condition actually has been met or not. Um, and if it has met, then you calculate, you use the open valve, and if, if it's not, you use the closed uh, the close, uh, set of equations for the valve. So nothing changes in this runge uh code, except that at the beginning of the calculation of every one of the elements of the runge kuta solution process, K1, K2, K3, and K4, we ask the question whether the valve is open or if it's closed. If it's open, we use the open system. If it's closed, we use the closed system. And we do that for the calculation of K1, K2, K3, right before the calculation. Well, the condition for K2 and K3 is identical because K2 and K3 are calculated at halfway through the time steps. And then for the calculation of K4, the same thing. You ask the question whether after one full time step, the valve still open or close. So you use the corresponding A0 or B0 or ACBC. And at the end, the solution at the next time level is the solution of the previous time level, minus one six of K1, 2K2, 3K3, and K4. That's for all the state variables from one to capital K, which in this case is three, B1, B2, and Q. And return the, the whole matrix, which has, in this case, 100 rows or 101 rows corresponding to the 101 time steps that we defined at the beginning, and three columns for P1, P2, and P3. I'm sorry, P1, P2, and Q. All right, so P1 is equal to the first column of Y, P2 is equal to the second column of Y. P0 is equal to delta P of the pump plus P2 according to the KVL equation. Okay, so I want to see, I want to see what P1, P2, and P0 look like to see when the valve's about to close. But if you look at the solution, look at these numbers. 5 times 10 to the 242, 1 times 10 to the 243, positive and negative. That means that the solution is diverging, diverging very badly. 
Okay. Even if you plot these for the first, let's say, during the first second, it basically is oscillating very badly. That means that the solution has diverged. So this time step size of 0 0.1 milliseconds is not enough to capture the solution. Even though it was it was enough before when we didn't have the diodes, this nonlinear has introduced enough instabilities into the system for the system to actually diverge and give you the wrong solution. Same thing here for the solution Q. The flow is the third column of the solution array Y. And uh, we're also going to define the Q of the pump. And the Q of the pump, remember, is P0 minus P1 divided by RB times the heavy side step function of P0 minus P1 minus PB. Okay? So this, uh, the heavy side step function in MathCAD is already predefined as capital F, uh, capital Greek F. Okay, so you just basically say capital F, control G, that's phi, that's capital phi, and cap, uh, of 1 is equal to 1, of minus 1 is equal to 0. So that's the, the heavy side step function, phi. So if the argument is negative, you get a 0. If the argument is positive, any positive number, you get a 1. Any negative number, minus 11, you get a 0. Okay. All right, but if you look at the flow, it's also diverged. It's diverged to the point that you have these huge oscillations that would lead to, uh, to infinite results. Uh, and that's what happens. In the first few time steps, the small oscillations, and those small oscillations actually carry over and accumulate and propagate to the point that after nine seconds or so, these oscillations are all the way up to infinity. Okay, so how do we, how do we fix this? Well, we use brute force. We essentially use more time steps. And let's use 10 times. Let's use twice as many time steps and let's see what happens. Okay. Now it's a little better. So we're only increasing the time steps or decreasing the time step size by a factor of two. The flow pump looks a little bit better. The same set of equations. Nothing changes. It's still oscillating, but notice the oscillation is a little bit better. It's 10 to the 223 instead of 242. It's still infinity, but something is helping this. Let's make it 1,000 time steps. So now the time step size is 0 0.01 and see if that is enough to actually mitigate the instability to be able to capture when the states are switching. Notice that the states are switching suddenly when the pressure differential across the valve goes positive, it goes to the open state or if not, it goes to the, the, the closed state. So if that's the case, if we use 10, notice now we have a solution. So the solution P1 and P2, which are the blue and the green lines, are as expected positive pressures and negative pressures. Okay. We also calculated P0, which is the pressure at the node before the valve. And the pressure of the node before the valve, according to KVL, is delta P of the pump plus P2. And that is this red line right here. Now, what the valve equation says, basically, is if P0 is larger than P1, if the red pressure is larger than the blue pressure, there will be flow across the pump and flow across the valve, which is the same, right? So as long as the red line is above the blue line, there will be flow. If the red line is below the blue line, like it's happening right here at these instances, the, the flow will stop, okay? So basically, if we plot the third column of the, uh, the third column of the, uh, of the uh, solution array, why? That will be Q, that will be the red line. So Q is always positive, right? As expected, because we only have compliances in parallel. We don't have compliances absorbing and releasing in series, making the flow negative. But the flow that goes through the pump, which is defined by this equation with a heavy side step function, right? Notice it actually gets cut off. It cuts off at zero. When it would actually go negative, it's getting cut off because of the heavy side step function, because when the pressure difference across the valve is P0 minus P1 is negative, the valve will actually stop pushing flow in the opposite direction or allowing flow in the opposite direction. So it goes effectively to zero. So this is just a slight modification that we made to the Runge-Kutta code, okay, including this conditional. Notice that we're not going to be able to get away with anything less than the, than the fourth order Runge-Kutta to solve these problems with valve because the valve, although being a very slight nonlinearity that is avoidable by switching systems, there's still the instabilities at the point of switching, exactly at the time when the flow uh, or when the 
uh, valve switches from close to open or from close from open to close, it will introduce these instabilities, and therefore we have to mitigate them by, in this case, I said brute force is essentially increasing the size of the delta t of, of of the number of time steps, or effectively the, uh, reducing the size of delta t. So if we make this ten thousand time steps, right, we expect a much more refined type of pressure distribution. We expect a solution that is no different than before, so it's actually converging to the right solution. So the solution looks very similar to the one before with uh, 1,000 time steps. It's just a lot slower. And we expect this flow to actually be more resolved as well. Okay, so we need to find out, well, when, when is, what is the correct size of delta T? What is the minimum size of delta T that we can afford, right? Or the maximum size of delta T that we can afford? Because we cannot just increase the size of time steps or increase the number of time steps because this will render the whole solution process a lot slower and we might not be able to afford that in a feedback control system that we're using to actually control a pacemaker or something like that in response to the to the flow to the flow signal so this is uh, this is it for today this was the introduction of diodes to uh, simulate the um, the work of valves in cardiovascular circuits and we went through an illustration and a, a verification through through the code and again what we found out is that now we have to be a little bit more careful with the size of the time step when um uh, when when simulating these valves so thank you for your attention and i'll see you in the office hours and i'll see you next time